Hi everyone and welcome for another paper session. So today I will try to read this paper uh, called An Extension of Erlang with Finite Domain Constraints by uh, Gregor Ottoson. And this paper is from 1995 and 1996 actually because I think it was it has been published in 1996. And that's quite a regal paper uh, with an implementation of uh, L on finite domain constraint implementation. That's not really an easy paper, so I read it first. And I'm not really sure if I understand uh, everything you can find in this paper. So be kind, this is my first time I'm reading a paper on finite domain constraint just to show you what we can do uh, with Erlang and what have been done like more than 30 years ago with this language. So anyway, let's start. So this paper is an extension of Erlang with finite domain constraint, constraint by Gregor Otteson. It have been created with Uppsala University and Ericsson company. And this is a master, master thesis. So let's start it. Here's the abstract. This report describes the design and implementation of a finite domain constraint solver for Erlang. The constraint solver handles linear arithmetic constraint over natural numbers, which are approximated using arc and interval consistency. We use a scheme with functional rules for constraint propagation and consistency maintenance and plain backtracking programming uh, programmed in Erlang to search for solution. We have a lot of really complicated word here. So first thing first, what is finite domain constraint? So finite domain constraint, uh, if you are a little bit aware of Prolog, that's a way to design your software to put some constraints. Constraints are kind of rules you will apply on some solution, some values, and if the constraint is valid, so your value, your values is valid as well. And the solver is exactly what we have with Prolog. So for example, uh, say you want to solve an equation, you have x, y, z, and if you want, if you have uh, x and y or something like that, you want to to, to know z and the solver here will apply the constraint on the equation to have the z as uh, answer. So that that's the idea and it, this is a big picture. Uh, the constraint solver on the linear arithmetic constraint over natural numbers. So that means we in this implementation we are only dealing with numbers. We can deal with strings or something like that, but I think it's enough. It's just a master, master thesis on and a kind of implementation uh, on Erlang, so that's 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 enough. And so we have arc and interval consistency. So arc and interval consistencies are uh, two way of finding a solution in um, in an universe of contra uh, of contrast uh, constraint and values. So. I will show you that with Wikipedia. So we have arc constraint, and I think you will understand it a little bit. So arc consistency. So d d d that's ID. So we have a constraint division. Um, uh, oh, 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 to explain that, uh, explain that correctly. Uh, here with this values there this uh, little schema you can diagram you can perhaps probably understand a little bit so we can find a solution here this is are, are consistent because every values here uh, can have uh, their result so we have the uh, uh, variables we have the the value of the variables and we have some constraint and we have the result if we are removing a constraint between uh, the x and x2 and x3 for example uh, this is not our consistency uh, anymore so that's that that's a bit more complex but actually this is a big picture and in the paper we will have another definition using Erlang and other formula 
and you have also the interval consistency i don't know if uh, you have these things on wikipedia i don't think so so anyway this is another way and we have also uh, a definition so here's the document uh, i think we will read the introduction uh, at first uh, the finite domain constraint introduction will be quite uh, interesting we can switch the along parts uh, we will talk a little bit about the design and read a little bit about the implementation. Uh, we will read the conclusion as well. And I think uh, after that we will take a look on how uh, things were made. Uh, I try to implement it just before doing this uh, recording. Uh, I think it's feasible. You can do it and implement it in maybe one week. If you are not really, if you, if you have uh, time, it's not my case. So if I have time, I will try just to implement only a really small subset, not using C, because actually this paper is implementing this, uh, this, this uh, finite domain constraint solver with C, but probably with Erlang. So anyway, let's start. So here, the introduction. So let's try to understand the background many computational problems can be stated as constraint over variables of some abstract domain packing scheduling and allocation are problems which can often be described using finite domain constraint basically a constraint satisfaction problem csp is composed of a finite set of variables of finite domains and a set of constraints that restricts values the variable can simultaneously take. The task is to assign value to all variables satisfying the constraint. Solving a CSP can be divided into two steps. The first, problem reduction, which involves reducing the variable's domains by removing redundant values and tightening the constraint, and Secondly, by searching for valid solutions through en enumeration. So this part here, this is a bit like oh, Prolog is working. So you put a, a free variable somewhere and you will create a goal. And this variable will, not variable, but the language and the structures, the program will try to find a solution and create a kind of equilibrium, you know, a stability between the variable and the result. CSP has been the subject of growing interest and research for the last 10 years, and many different approaches have been made. Both special purpose programs with domain specific knowledge on generic solvers for classes of problems have emerged. To the latter one, May Kuhn's extension to logic programming, forming constraint logic programming, or CLP. From a CSP perspective, constraint solver and CLP are an intertwined mixture of the two phases problem reduction and search mentioning above. The CLP community have approached CSP by using different techniques for different domains and Thus, there are CLPB, CLPFD, and CLPR for solving Boolean, finite, and rational domain problems, respectively. Okay, so this, this one, I think, it's the one we are reading in this paper. Boolean constraint problems can for example be solved using boolean unification while problems with rational numbers are commonly dealt with using some derivative of the simplex algorithm in this report we will describe one approach for solving finite domain problems okay as you, as you can see i already read uh, this paper yesterday and put some highlight on the part that seems quite important at least for me but not probably for you at least i need to <laughs> to show you that 
So as a cherry behind the family of CLP language, CLPX is based on logic programming where unification is replaced by a with constraint, constraint handling in a constraint system. So we have up again a lot of really really important words here and definition. Uh, we should probably take a look on that later. And then Rick's CLP scheme defines a class of languages of which an instance can be obtained by considering a specific constraint system, a computation domain, and for that provide a constraint solver. The output from a CLP X language is an answer substitution, so values for the variables or a conjunction of answer constraint. The CLP frameworks has later uh, been extended by the research on concurrent constraint programming. The original notion of adding putting constraint C to A uh, to a constraint tor uh, sigma. Uh, yes, sigma, sigma, sigma prime uh, equals sigma union C is called tilling. The term ask is introduced with which we mean to check if constraint C is entailed in the constraint store sigma. So for all uh, for all value uh, sigma is defining C or something like that. Sorry, I'm a bit rusty in <laughs> mathematic definition. So here this is an union, so we are things that uh, we are it's kind of I could, I could say concatenation, for example, where we are putting uh, one value in the same store. So here we have the constraint, we have the constraint stored, and so we are putting the constraint in the store. So we have no uh, sigma prime. This is a new sigma with a new constraint in it. But I'm not sure. I, we will see that later. I think <laughs> when we are reading a paper like that, and we are when you are not working in mathematics. Uh, you, you need to read the whole paper and come back after if you don't understand something. So anyway, along uh, FD for finite, uh, finite, finite domain, sorry. Uh, this work aims at embedding finite domain constraint within the concurrent functional language Erlang. The object is to make the language more versatile and flexible and to extend the class of target problems. That's quite funny because Erlang was uh, created using Prolog, and in Prolog we have already a subset of this kind of implementation in it. And so that means here we want to re-implement something that were from that was from Prolog and put it directly in the Erlang runtime. Why adding the notion of constraint to a language like Erlang? Well, the high-level flavor of Erlang and its concurrency make it good for reactive and distributed systems, but it likes to pour for programming complex scheduling, planning, and control. And that's very true. The embedding of constraint within Erlang would make up for this and make it feasible to program reactive constraint solving and distributed constraint system. And that is really, really interesting. Because at this time, if I remember correctly, uh, we don't really have a way to solve distributed uh, constraint. But I'm not sure. Uh, actually, I think we, we will have a look on other paper later. But for example, if you want to do those kind of uh, solver, distributed solvers, uh, you will need to check something like something different than Erlang. Uh, you have something uh, a bit like that with Prolog and the uh, engine, I guess, but this is not distributed. This is uh, concurrent or parallel, you know, this is not distributed at all. So this is a good way to start something that could do really great stuff. So, for example, if you have a node running on something with different kind of constraint and another node with other constraint and so on, and you can send a message to those kind of distributed environments and you can solve the equation in a distributed manner. So that's, that's pretty awesome. A constraint system used in a reactive environment with special properties such as the ability to suspend during say logging or backup procedure and the ability to interact with processes. In how long an interfaceable constraint store from which processes could extract and subscribe to information and events will be valuable. With this feature, 
at the end, the provider of information, say a sensor, a user interface or telephone switch, will not have to care about what information is used on what by on by what process. That's that's also interesting. Because giving some information to this kind of system, uh, you can solve a lot of different stuff. So anyway, uh, posting the information as entailed constraints in the store would be sufficient since processes from there could, as, could extract information in an intelligent manner. In this first attempt, we do as much as possible inside Erlang using its memory management process scheduling control structures and syntax. The bulk of our implementation is written in Erlang itself. It makes our solver preemptive and fulfill our need for suspending solver. We further aim at making it possible for processes in Erlang to interface to our constraint in a manner similar to agents in concurrent constraint programming. It is as primitive, if optionally asynchronous, would make it possible for processes to subscribe to events. So our approach is based on the world of Björn Skalson with AKL FD. Uh, I think I have this paper. Uh, I just take a look on it uh, quick, and unfortunately, I didn't have really have uh, time to. <laughs> To, to, to dig in a little bit more. Uh, differences between AKL and Erlang as well as our aim to use Erlang as a primary implementation language has forced us to make different design decisions, especially concerning the search and interface to Erlang. However, those familiar with Carlson what will recognize the similarities. Our main focus in this on implementation aspect and design issues regarding the interface to Erlang. Our work has been mainly practical on this report is therefore mainly a description of what has, what has been done. But you have a lot of theory as well. And unfortunately I was <laughs> looking for the code on GitHub but somewhere else. Uh, like for example on the official page of, uh, of this author and I didn't find anything. And it's <laughs> I'm a bit sad because I, I would really like to, 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 to use it in, in current Erlang implementation, you know, with the latest relays and the JIT and so on. It, it would have been really, really nice to have those kind of stuff. But anyway, I, I will try to contact him and say, he, you know, try to, to have an idea if he, he, he already have, uh, still have his, uh, his project somewhere. So, summary, uh, this are the goal of this work to investigate the feasibility of embedding finite domain constraints within Erlang to determine, determine the appropriate user interface of such an extension to implement the notion of ask in a way that makes it useful in Erlang programming and to evaluate the performance and reflect upon the design decision and the implementation. Okay, so I think we can just switch this page and we will read the pre preliminaries. So, uh, finite domain constraints. So we, here we have a short definition of what is finite domain constraints. The idea of programming with constraint is based on the notion of constraint on a constraint store. A constraint is intuitively expresses some relation on a set of variables. A constraint store is simply a set of constraints. In this section, we consider our constraint and the collection of them in a constraint store, blah, blah, blah. We can switch and go to the next part. So arithmetic finite domain constraint. Since we are dealing with finite domain constraint, our constraint are expresses as arithmetic expression over subset of the natural numbers, n0. And arith an arithmetic constraint consists of a two linear terms together with the relation so n1 x1 nk xk uh, time nk okay where okay so this is the operation symbol i guess and so this operation symbol uh, is a set 
of those operations. So it should be in equal, equal, uh, greater, uh, less, uh, less or equal to, and so on. And if we don't have those kind of stuff, uh, the it will not work. So that's that's interesting. So in Erlang, uh, how to represent this kind of stuff? We can represent that with a common operator, or we can create some uh, lambda function uh, with one or two in arity, or maybe a multiple arity uh, to express all those kind of lists as operation. And so we can store store them, and we can we can uh, apply all those constraints somewhere. Uh, yeah, that's that's constraint. A constraint is a relation over one or more variables, so x greater than uh, x is equal or greater than y uh, plus 2. A domain constraint is a, is a constraint x uh, present in the set of n1 to nk, where ni is from n0. Constraint store is a set of domain constraints. The value of x is, a, is uh, the value of x in a store sigma x sigma is near is there by uh, n zero, <laughs> which is the inverse of union. <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, so we are removing it from uh, the the union. Uh, this is not union. This is. <laughs> Uh, I don't remember. Never mind. Uh, for example, x uh, sigma, where sigma is equal to x uh, from 1 to 3, and x from 3 to 4 equals set 3, because this is the only values we have present from those two parts. And for onion constraint made uh, y y sigma equals n zero. Okay. So what does it mean? Uh, what does it mean? Okay. So let's see. Might be a constraint store. The following is defined. So here we are. We have the, the definition of the constraint store. So Satisfiability one. Sigma is said to be satisfiable only if, if and only if no x sigma is empty for any x. So if we are creating that in Erlang, it's an empty list. So I think in in, in um, mathematical notation, it's an empty set. Extension uh, sigma prime is an extension of sigma. If and only if x pre x sigma uh, is a subset of x sigma. So this is from uh, set theory, maybe. And if I remember correctly, this is a subset or something like that. So that means this element should be present in this one. Or maybe the reverse stuff. This element should be present in this one or something like that for any x. But differently, uh, sigma prime is an extension of sigma if and only if sigma prime defines sigma. That is, sigma prime is a strengthening of the domain constraint in sigma. Okay. Entailment. A constraint C is said to be entailed in sigma if and only if C is true in all satisfiable extension of sigma, but differently. C will always be true whatever strengthening of constraint is done in sigma. Okay, so we have another satisfiability rules. The constraint C is satisfiable in sigma if and only if it is entailed by some extension of sigma. That is, a constraint is satisfiable as long as it has the possibility of being entailed. Okay, inconsistency. Consistency is a concept with which one may exercise problem prediction. A constraint store is said to be consistent with respect to certain property if and only if the property holds. Maintaining consistency 
does implies removing values and tightening constraint to maintain the properties. A constrainter is inconsistent if it is not consistent, does not satisfy the properties. Consistency with a certain property is not a sufficient condition for a problem to be solvable. A problem may be consistent but insatisfiable. Different algorithms achieve different level of consistency. Satisfiability being the best. An algorithm guaranteeing satisfiability is often called complete. Okay. So, uh, it's so, so, for example, the arc. Uh, if we come back to the definition of arc, you can see uh, we. I think we can't. In some way, this kind of algorithm is not consistent and. Yeah, anyway, I think we have a kind of definition of that later. When talking about consistency, we annotate the term with the properties we maintain. For example, section blah, 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 will define two common consistency levels, arc and interval consistency. For a, a through examination of satisfiability and consistency from a viewpoint of constraint satisfaction problem, see it saying, okay. So again, I have also this paper. Uh, this one I, I i'm not sure i have this one but uh, i have this one here and i didn't have time to read it uh, so i just read a, a, a small part of it given a constraint store sigma uh, containing two containing two variables i guess uh, present in the set of uh, zero to ten uh, then uh, sigma is satisfiable so there is no empty sets uh, present. Uh, if we are applying these things here, so for example, uh, if x have a subset 2 to 6 and y have a subset of uh, 0 to 10, that means this is an extension of sigma. If x is greater or equal than uh, 4 is satisfiable in sigma this value it's not satisfiable because actually we don't have these values present here and if x is less or equal than uh, smaller or equal than uh, 11 that means it's entitled in sigma so i think we have a part of the value but we don't have old value for the rest of the report, the following notation will be used. So we have the sigma definition, a constraint store. C, uh, C is a constraint. Uh, C with a number of viable uh, arguments uh, with n arity constraint can be true or false. So that means if it's this element is instantiated, it should return true or false. We have the constraint variable or integer. We have the value, uh, always an integer. We have the domain of variable x in uh, sigma, so x sigma. Sigma x is the constraint on x in sigma. And we have the tuple x uh, v. It's asymptote of value v to variable x. So I think that means when we find a solution and we have the final integer, uh, the value here is directly mapped to the x uh, variable and so that means we have the, the relation between two variables. The concepts of ask and tell originated in the area of concurrent programming and was adopted in CLP. By tell we mean to add a constraint c in a constraint store sigma. The term ask means checking if constraint c is entirely in constraint store sigma. So uh, with on, on the airline point of view it's you are sending a message in this message uh, you have a new constraint and if the constraint is valid we can put it directly in the state uh, in the process or maybe a little bit different uh, we can put this constraint in a list or you know this list uh, can be after uh, exported and reused by other processes for example
and when we say the term ask that means we are calling a process and we are waiting for the answer and to check if the constraint is correctly present in the store that's that's all i am <laughs> i am currently understanding uh, this paper the traditional technique for achieving and maintaining consistency in finite fine uh, finite domain constraint solvers have been our consistency intuitively the consistency property is that all constraints should be individually satisfiable our consistency for n array constraint can be defined more precisely as follow a constraint c is r consistent if and only if for each variable x y uh, yeah x y with domain g y and value v i is from g i there is values v1 to v n in g1 to g1 minus 1 and g that's 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 horrible to <laughs> to read this kind of formula directly in english uh okay so just to make things clear we are that and our consistent stuff are uh, I will do it again. Uh, so our consistent definition is clear and only work and is uh, uh, is working if we have some variables present in, the dom in one domain and we have the same values present in the same domain. If I'm understanding correctly, a constraint store sigma is our consistent if and only if all constraints in sigma are our consistent so if we have other constraint they should have al they should also be uh, consistent between them i guess <laughs> so our consistency is achieved by eliminating values from viable domains that are inconsistent with any single constraint and our consistency algorithm for binary constraint only called ASCIS3 is presented as algorithm 2.1 so this part here I started to implement it in Erlang and uh, I think I need more time so maybe if uh, I have an answer from the author of this paper I will try to re-implement it completely in Erlang but right now it's this algorithm is uh, the implementation of this definition here so we are taking all variable x from sigma we are all taking values from uh, x sigma so that means for example 0 to 10 here we have some variable and we will apply everything from the constraint and we will extract only the values they are validating those constraints what uh, yeah you know delete an element x from x u for each and yeah. if there is the blah 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 remove a from the main of x in fact here you know we are attributing some values and if if the algorithm is happy with that you know if it's written true we keep the value if it returns false we remove the value what the algorithm does is it to check all constraint and remove any value from the corresponding target domain that do not satisfy the constraint on the variable so that's exactly what i was saying we have a list of values we have a list of constraint and we are checking all the files the values directly from the constraint if values are removed from a variable domain constraints that may be affected by this are recruit re queued this is repeated until it stabilizes. This uh, the queue of constraints is empty. There are some remarks that need to be made about this approach on this algorithm. Efficiency. The algorithm is not naive with respect to which constraint it it checks, whereas a naive algorithm would consider and check all constraints repeat, repeatedly. AC3 I vote this by maintaining a queue of constraints that need to be checked. Constraints are only added to this queue if there is a reason to believe 
that they need to be checked when viable domain of the constraint has been reduced. Also, not naive, AC3 is not optimal. With respect to constraint check, there exists an optimal algorithm called AC4. This algorithm has better time complexity but has worse space complexity. That means it requires a larger amount of space to maintain a consistency for a problem. It is not commonly used in constraint solver and we will not consider it further. Constraint array, as pointed out above, AC3 only deals with an array through NC1 and binary constraint. For most purposes, such as ours, this is not enough. There exists an extension of AC3 called Hyper AC3, which deals with constraint with higher arity. But since we use a slightly different approach of handling constraint that solve this problem, we do not consider it, consider it here. Okay, so that, I, I think this is not really, really, really interesting. This part here, uh, it is important to once again. Oh, oh, that's considered is not equivalent to such. Okay, so this is the, the definition of why, in some specific value and sets, uh, this algorithm is not working correctly. So we have a constraint, an easy one. So x is um, smaller than y, and we have two domain: one, two, three, and one, two, three, four. One will be able to remove one from the domain of y since there is no value in the domain x that satisfies the constraint when y is equal to 1. So, an R consistency algorithm such as S3 will accomplish this. So, actually, it will remove this one. But in some other situation, so for example, with this constraint, x is not equal to y and y is not equal to z and z is not equal to x and with domain x y z containing only two values 0 and 1 uh, this is not satisfiable since there are three variables on only two values but since the r consistency technique does not consider the constraint as a whole but as binary constraint it will not discover the insatisfiability. In other words, constraints are only are consistent but not satisfiable. What does it mean? That means uh, if x equal 0, that means y should be equal to, uh, equal to 1, but z should then be equal to 0. But in this case, x can be equal to 0 as well and should be equal to to be equal to 1. But because uh, of the arc consistency uh, properties, uh, this is arc consistent, but this is currently not satisfiable because we don't have the correct value. For example, if we add 0, 1, uh, 2, so we could say the answer for this problem would be x equal 0. Uh, y equal 1 and c equal 2 and this is satisfiable and are consistent but here this is not the case with those kind of values i i don't i don't know if i'm clear here but that's that's the idea and here this is particularly the same so if we have x and is less than y uh if x uh, is equal to 1 uh, the first element here will be dropped because this is not valid but when we do, for example, x equal 1 and we have a 2, 3, 4, it's working because y here, say uh, x equal 1 and y equal 2, so we have uh, this constraint written true and it's valid. I, I'm not sure if it's clear what I'm saying, but uh, the notation here is saying that we will just attribute x and y uh, for each value and just match this constraint here and if the constraint is valid so we can say this is an answer of the equation interval consistency 
In definition 214 on the facing page we use domain reasoning about constraint to achieve our consistency. This can sometimes be inconvenient or too expensive to carry out. Therefore we sometimes use interval reasoning instead instead. So we have another definition I will not read. A constraint C is interval constant if and only if for each variable blah blah blah. A constraint store sigma is interval consistent if and only if all constraints in sigma are interval consistent. Let sub x be the supremum on if x infimum of an expression x then interval consistency as chief using mean and max reasoning as in the following example. A constraint x greater than y can be interpreted as x should at least be greater than the smallest possible value of y, implying that x must be in the set a uh, and a should be greater than uh, the greatest value from the set sec, uh, sorry from the um, set y I think um, yeah I think it's it that if we take the previous example that mean yeah I think it that so if we are we are for example zero one two three uh, x here y should be greater than three for example but I'm, I'm not sure yet let's see if if the author is explaining that as you see we do not check that for every single element from the domain of x there is a satisfiable element from the domain y instead we ensure that the lower bone of x interval is greater than the lower bone of y interval so that's that was what i our thing so this is the greatest value here and it should be greater than this one if it's not the case uh, we are returning an error um we're returning false so this value is dropped as you will see later uh, our implementation technique is based on an r consistency algorithm operating on constraint with annuity we use indexical as our programming language to achieve consistency and the consistency maintaining is most often our consistency or interval consistency. I will, I will switch and go to the next uh, part of the indexical because I think we have a lot of things to, 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 to read after. Uh, quick summary, uh, this is those kind of operator. Uh, so this is new operators you need to implement. Uh, and so we can switch also this part here. Oh, maybe not. An identical range is considered monotone in sigma if its value, a set, shrink when sigma is extended. If it grows, it is considered anti monotone. The monotonicity of an indexical is computed at compile time. Okay, so I think we would switch this part here. We already lot, uh, read a lot of stuff on the theoretical part. So this is the introduction of uh, how to use Erlang. And here we have the design. This is, I think, one of the most important parts with uh, the annexes at the end of the document. So the central block of Erlang FD is a constraint solver which is located in a separate process. Allocation of variables and telling of constraints are done by sending message to the solver process. So that's what I was thinking just, uh, just before. So every time we need to put a new constraint or solve something, you're just sending a message and we are, we are waiting for an answer. Also, this is not visible by the programmer. The so execution of the user process is the separated from the solver which has both negative and positive effects so we have the robustness the user process is not dependent on the solver may, may run concurrently easier to maintain a state of the solver algorithm easier to distribute the solver 
and message sending overhead since all communication with the solver used messages. So that's a big drawback of Erlo because actually you are sending messages and because you are sending messages you are doing, dealing with the physical world. That means message should be uh, present in the process. In fact, the process should receive this message, trade this message, and send you uh, another message as answer. Uh, the programmer source code content constraint, blah blah blah. We can switch that. And here we have uh, the, 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 oh, oh, the design uh, was created. So we have the compile time, uh, we are creating what we need, we have the user process, in this user process we have the, we have the variables and the calls. So this is done directly during compile, ty compile time, the variable as well, so we are initially, yeah, the user process we uh, have those variables during the init phase. And then we have the solver process, and in this solver process we have the index equal and the variable as well. And we have the bytecode emulator, the one made in C, that will be that will take those kind of index equal and variable, thread them, and return the answers uh, as variables. And those variables will as just uh, we are just uh, forwarded to the user process and to the programmer as answer. Okay, so consequently, when a program has been compiled, its constraint consists solely of index equals. This index equals are at written time sent to the constraint solver process along with the finite domain variable the program allocates. The constraint solver process running a propagation algorithm evaluates index equals as they come in on pronounced domains of the variable. So that's yeah, the propagation algorithm makes called bytecode emulator to evaluate the ranges of the index equals based on the current values of the finite domain variable. And we will check a look at that because this is one of the part I'm really interested in. Uh, the interface to the emulator is based on beef, so okay. I wanna, uh, Okay, since Erlon does not provide means for search, uh, search, neither backtracking nor otherwise, this had to be implemented in the solver. So, if I understand correctly, they are trying to implement a kind of prologue language emulator somewhere uh, just um, connected to the Erlon virtual machine. To get an efficient interface to the emulator, which is written in C, we choose to extend along with a few beef, uh, gaining access to the emulator, which was linked in with the Erlang runtime system. These beef are described in Appendix A, so we will check that later. Implementation. Now, that's 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 the interesting part. We will now consider two approaches to handle finite domain arithmetic constraints. The first is based on compiling directly to index equals. The second, which shows an intermediate representation called library constraint, in is the one used in our implementation. Okay, so the straightforward way to compile a constraint of say 2x plus y equal z is to extract each variable in turn and for each create an inline index equal which maintains a relation from right to left only. This technique has previously been used in uh, Jazz, Codonet, uh, Carlson, Carlson. Our example can be expre expressed as three index equals. So this um, equation here. Uh, can be converted in those three forms. So we have x in, so here, and we are just transposing those kind of equations uh, there. So the best way, I think the first one we need to read is this one here, because this is literally the same. So z in uh, the interval from x and y, two times 
and we have also the other interval max y max uh, max x and max y two times so this is uh, this equation and y and x there are just when you are pushing these values for example uh, y equal uh, z minus 2x and that's it should be the case here so we have uh, min uh, z minus max y and we are dividing hmm, by 2 why because we have x oh yeah it's normal because we have x so x uh, that means we have uh, z minus y uh, divided by 2 and so we have that okay and for y if we are just y we are just z minus here so that's that's a true way to 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 fight a solution so i think those elements will be converted as constraint uh, maintaining travel consistency of the constraint. Okay, this indexical app process one measure to roll back the code size for the recurrent indexical grows gradually. Yeah, the amount of indexicals required is the amount of the variable on the side of the indexicals are almost the same, making the growth uh, O n square. This fact makes this way of expressing constraint unattractive for constraint with height arity. Yeah, so if we have more than two variables, uh, it's, it, it's, it's becoming a bit complex. Library constraints. The problem is translating, translating iterity arithmetic constraint directly to indexicals come from the fact that code is very much duplicated. Each part of a term will occur almost identically in n-1 of n indexicals. This can be avoided by introducing intermediate variable a technique which is exploited in this approach the following translation is done partly compile time and partly runtime we introduce a middle step between arithmetic constraint and index equals called library constraint which defines temporary variable in terms of sub expression of the arithmetic constraint the library constraint constraint are in fact ordinary Erlang functions consisting solely of index equals. These index equals maintain interval consistency on the argument to the function. So if I understand correctly, we are creating a library with those constraints and we are reusing them later. Okay, so they are already created some kind of library constraint and we are reusing it when we need. Choosing which library constraint to use is a balance between introducing a lot of indexical or introducing a lot of intermediate variables. Simple library constraint produces a number of indexicals created, but in turn, the composition of this library constraint requires more intermediate variables. Hypothetically speaking, using arbitrary complex library constraint means avoiding composition which is equivalent to compiling directly to index equals. Okay. Compiling arithmetic expression to library constraints is here done in three steps as shown below. Strict arithmetic relations are eliminated from the arithmetic expression. The expression is normalized. And the normalized expression is finally decomposed into the appropriate library constraint. Okay, we have a lot, a lot of code. I think I will, I will switch uh, here because it's, it's become a bit, a bit complex to explain uh, uh, to me. Lined index equal. I think I could explain it to, to you guys uh, if uh, I had <laughs> time to implement it somewhere. But right now it's, it's a bit hard. Inline index equal versus library constraint. Okay, so we have a lot of uh, definition here. And we have some code example. Propagation algorithm. The core of the constraint solver is a propagation algorithm. It ensures consistency in the constraint solver by evaluating index equals and printing variables. 
So that's that's the algorithm we just uh, shown uh, during at the first uh, part of the of the document. The domains of variables are pruned by the evaluation of index equals, and this triggers other index equals which print some variables. As you might have noticed by the description, this is many way to similar to AC3. The naive algorithm is presented. Okay. So that's another algorithm. What's good? What's what's how it works? So we have Q, we have sigma, uh, while Q not empty. Do if Q is present, uh, I think it's divided. Present. I don't know if sent in set theory what this symbol means. Probably present in uh, suspended index equal on Y for H x in r in s2 by s continue if empty monotone in z marks in this container will continue okay so we are just uh, i think we will switch this part here i need more time to read it uh, propagation optimization okay variable q uh, so we have the table uh, with running the optimized propagation algorithm compiling and evaluating ranges and we have the emulator the range emulator in our implementation originates in the IQL FT work carried by Bjorn Carlson for his PhD thesis the source code has been somewhat modified and adapted to fit into the runtime environment of Erlang the interface to the emulator in through PIF and they are described in Epidemics A on page 57. The FD emulator uh, evaluates ranges in the store sigma. Uh, okay, furthermore, it performs intersection. Uh, in sigma intersection. Oh, this is not an union, this is an intersection. Uh, R sigma has shown his algorithm uh, 4.2 on page 31. Those are the implementation bytecode instructions. So that's the bytecode instructions. So we have the console DOM domain. All this thing is working. I, I, <laughs> I would really like to implement this one. The emulator is provided uh, with the bytecode and the code from A for the code represented by a vector of domain variables furthermore the emulator provides on three data areas the code area c the value stack v containing the integers or references to domains and the domain e d at each invocation of the emulator d is assumed empty okay compiling and evaluating ranges that's that's a huge work. That's that's a master thesis. So <laughs> we will switch to the searching for solution. The propagation algorithm previously described in section 4.3 on page 25 achieves and maintains consistency. This is well, but not enough. Not only do we need a consistent constraint store which propagates constraint on print variable domains, we also need to find specific solution to our stated constraint problem. A backtracking scheme. The state of the constraint store is that we have some variable with more or less pruned domains. Along with them, there are a bunch of constraints as index equals. Remember, remember that since our server is not complete, not all combination of values from the variable domains are solution. Okay. And so we have the implementation here. So we have the vi variable one, next value, rest of files, and we have the pointer to the choice and the data. Okay. Find the current the data on the trade stack is the other data from the variable or index equals the following table show. Okay, I want pointer to the variable index equal variable ordering. Uh, naive labeling shows the first variable at n, uh, thus making the choice uh, more or less random. Okay, first file labeling shows variable with the smallest domain or the largest amount of constraints suspended on it. 
this heuristic is dynamic. Uh, check for smallest domain in made at runtime and suggest that the task which is most likely to fire should be performed first. Search can be avoided by recognizing dead ends as soon as possible. This technique is useful only when finding one or a few solutions to a problem. When searching for all solutions, we have to traverse the entire search base and it will not matter in which order we do it. Okay, and we have the data structure. Finite domain variable. Uh, there are actually two representations of a finite domain variable. The representation in the user process and the representation in the solver process. The finite domain variable is represented as a tuple consisting of the following parts. Uh, atom identifying type of structure, unique structure, not referring to OK, comment to the user, list of suspended at SQL, boolean flag indicating if variable has been traded since last choice point. The domain of the variable, the boolean flag, the variable is crewed in the propagation algorithm, and one of non in okay, tells the type of the last pruning. Okay, and at in this instance, and I have the sleeper. Okay, a finite domain, so finite domain in air long FT. Is either an Erlang integer or tuple of the following format? Okay, atom indicating okay, either interval or set, lower bound, upper bound, bit vector. And finally, we have the finite domain at x equals, and it has been represented as a tuple. And in this tuple, we have the atom indicating that this tuple represents an index equal, so I think index equal, uh, unique notifiers, target variable in the, uh, of the index equal, the argument variable in the index equal range, the dependencies, the bycode for evaluating the range expression of the index equal in the emulator. And th that's, that's interesting. So they are compiling this code and they are directly embedding them in a tuple. A flag set if index equal is untailed and this flag is shared between several equivalent index equals uh, monodosini set uh, mr and anti monodosini set r okay evaluation so uh, i read also this part and we have like a lot of example uh, here and so we have also the benchmarks I, I don't really care about this part here. Uh, if, if you are curious, just take a look on the paper. It's freely available on the web. Uh, so you should not have a lot of problem to, to have it. And you can find it in awesome Erlang uh, list. Providing Erlang. So actually, I don't really care also in this part. Um, and we have the conclusion. So... Uh, this report have described the work of embedding finite domain constraint into the functional programming language Erlang. We have extended the expressive net of the language by, by allowing arithmetic expression to be stated as facts and developed a solver for generating solutions satisfying these facts as constraint. Our performance evaluation and comparison to other constraints server show that Erlang FG like in performance. So at this time, and probably even today, uh, Erlang is not so powerful. And that mean we need, if, if you need to, if you want to do really, if you need performance, you know, like really, really fast interpretation of something you should probably implement it in c or any kind of low uh low level languages and plug this implementation directly in the beam with respect to the fact that the gap is quite large we have pointed out possible weaknesses in the implementation suggested solutions of our goals with this work we succeeded with all but one 
there was no time to implement the ask primitive and thus our vision of processes and directing with the constraint store like agent in concurrent concern programming was not fulfilled. We still think that is possible and that the expressive net of Erlang would gain from it. The following section is concerned with the first development of constraint in Erlang and constraint solver in general. Future work with the history of constraint satisfaction problem and the evolution of constraint logic programming in mind, we will here try to point at some possible use and approaches regarding constraint solver in general and constraint in Erlang especially. Future development of Erlang FD first. One of the major tasks with first development on Erlang FD will be to gain performance. So yeah. This is not a single key to make constraint in Erlang useful, one must show reasonably reasonable efficiency. Being approximately a magnitude of slower than comparable solver is not acceptable for, ac acceptable for real world programs. Secondly, the ask primitive should be designed and implemented. Its semantic is not as obvious, obvious as in CLP since there is no search in Erlang to enter a quiz as it does in logic programming. Finally, the aim of embedded constraint in language like Erlang should be to plan and help with the kind of tasks that Erlang are used to solve. We imagine the primary use of constraint in Erlang would be of semantics, not on raw speed. Uh, next. Let's go there. Processes interacting with the solver should be able to both add and remove constraints, control the search and through the constraints to affect other processes. So this part is really, really important. If we add that, that we have a really great stuff. Uh, going work, so we can switch that. So one question I have uh, after reading this paper, uh, we will just check a little bit on the on the building. Uh, function uh, actually those are the one uh, those have been implemented in, uh, in the beam itself to execute uh, the code so we have some kind of debugging beef uh, we have also the, uh, the size and so on so I'm not really sure it's really, really interesting but we have the user manual and I think in this case we have also some example so for example this one here you can state uh, your linear arithmetic concern directly. So we have an example here. How to solve, for example, x uh, there. So we are executing uh, so from the module FG is the function tell, and we put this kind of element. And we should have in return uh, the x value. Uh, using lexicals, blah, blah, blah syntax and semantic matching solution and we have the solve here with the list of variables the module the function and the list of values uh, this is quite similar to the thing we can see in for example SW, uh, SWI prolog I will show you that right now so for example we have solve I guess Up, um, and we have kind of uh, similar stuff here, you know. Uh, predicates are provided to work with constraint, and so we have the list of constraints to minimize, maximize, and we should have something to uh, to to deal with uh, those kind of evaluation and play with the constraint, like as you can see. But so uh, to be clear, this paper is to explain how to implement a kind of prolog system directly connected to Erlang and here you have some example so we have the initialization of the finite uh, domain program application and we can create the, you know the, the different uh, variable so here for example we have uh, send more money implementation and we are generating a list of variables uh, stored in uh, two range 
and we can do the same for the others. F daily uh, all different. Okay, so we are uh, waiting for the solution. We are sending uh, the equation to solve, and we are solving the equation, and we are closing it. We are returning the solution. And I think you, uh, as you can see, you have a lot of different examples. So uh, again, papers is not uh, paper session is not to to implement everything uh, every time. Uh, even more when this is the master thesis, this is quite hard to. Uh, to, to, to read more than 50 pages in less than one hour and actually it's not the case I've made it. <laughs> I think I will need probably one week to, to implement everything and to explain everything but the idea is to show you if you are stuck in some airlong problems you can find a lot of solution out there and you can have an idea of how to solve those problem by different kind of solution and here we have for example a way to solve uh, problems in Erlang using constraint programming unfortunately I didn't find this code uh, the source user library variable ordering library constraint but I am not sure I have the whole code uh, in C for example you know so you have a bit of the implementation but you don't have the whole implementation by itself I hope uh, for the next papers maybe I will have access to other implementation of this kind of technology in Erlang but actually this is not the case anyway if you are curious uh, you can just check this paper it's freely available. It's called an extension of Erlang with finite domain constraint. And if you want to know a little bit more about how Prolog is working, how finite domain constraint is working, and if you are just an Erlang developers without any experiences in these domains, um, I think this is a good way to start. And if you have Wikipedia or another books on those field, it could be really helpful, helpful to you. Uh, anyway, uh, I've learned a, a lot of stuff today. Uh, I think I will come back later on these papers if I don't find another one talking about that. But again, uh, if you are working in artificial intelligence, I think this paper could probably help you to understand a few stuff on how to solve those kind of problems in the finite domains uh, constraint uh, programming language and so on. So anyway, uh, see you later for the next papers and yeah, I hope you enjoyed this recording. See you later. Bye.